What's going on, everybody? My name is Corbin Lubert. I am the head strength coach at Allegiant Gym South Bay, and this is the AMA for Block 5. All right, everybody. Welcome to Block 5. Ask me anything. It's going to be short and sweet. Let's dive right into it. So our first question, ask for my thoughts on CBD for recovery. So this is probably going to be like a 1% difference maker for you. If you are doing everything else right, meaning you are getting eight hours of sleep, you're drinking half your body weight in ounces of water, you're getting seven to eight servings of vegetables, you're getting one gram per pound of your body weight in protein, CBD might be something that helps you recover a little bit faster and mitigate a little bit of soreness. However, if you're not doing all those other things right, then CBD is not some magic pill that's going to take care of all of that for you. In addition to, if you're not training very hard, then the CBD is not going to matter anyway. So it's a little bit of a give and a take there. But again, there are no shortcuts. So we want to really focus in on your daily habits, the things that I just mentioned that are going to really move the needle. And then if we want to you know, worry about some of this other stuff, whether it be CBD, whether it be taking ice baths, some of this other stuff that you see out there online that really, you know, people really push because I think the public people like yourselves really like general solutions that they think and they're pitched to you as, hey, these things are going to make a really big difference in your life when in the long run, you're probably not even going to notice. So focus on the really, really big things. And if you want to try out some of these small things, as long as you're doing that other stuff right, that's perfectly fine. But if you're not doing that other stuff right, then get that stuff right first. My next question asks for my thoughts on lifting gloves. So a lot of people like to wear lifting gloves or they might get the idea to wear lifting gloves because they don't want to develop these rough calluses on their hands from holding on to the barbells and the dumbbells. In my experience using lifting gloves, which was a long time ago, like middle school, but in my experience wearing lifting gloves, it negatively affects your grip strength. So if I'm trying to hold on to a bar or hold on to a, like a pull-up bar and I'm holding, I'm using gloves, then that not having the, the glove against my skin starts to slide as my hand goes down. And it makes me not be able to hold on for as long as if I had a, you know, nothing there, if I was just using a bare hand, uh, much less something like straps or a hook grip. So in that case, we're looking at a performance decrement there. It's going to hurt our performance in the weight room. Now, if you're worried about calluses, I've said this before, any reason that you have to worry about calluses, that's just a mental hurdle that you need to get over. And nobody, when you shake their hand, is really looking at you like, wow, this person's got a really rough hand. I don't think I've ever once thought that when I go to shake somebody's hand. So maybe if you work in a job or a field where you're having to put your hands on people, if you're a massage therapist or an esthetician or something along those lines, and you use your hands on other people's skin a lot more regularly, it makes sense. But at the same time, it's not worth taking that decrease in performance so that you don't develop a little bit rougher skin on your hands. So get over that mental hurdle and just start developing those calluses. The next question asks, how many eccentric pull-ups in a row before I think they should be able to do a regular pull-up? There's a lot of variables that go into answering this question. So first of all, an eccentric pull-up is when you climb up, maybe you put the, your foot on the bar in front of you, you climb up, get your chin above the pull-up bar, and then you take your foot off of whatever it was on to climb up, and you let yourself down nice and slow. That would be an eccentric pull-up, a negative pull-up, something along those lines. So off the top of my head, I would have, you know, press to give you an answer. I would say if you can do four sets of four with a 10 second eccentric, you should probably be able to do a regular pull up. Now that's not going to be true for everybody. There's going to be genetic differences. There's going to be different limb lengths, different body weights, all things like that. So one doesn't equal one here. We could, you know, take this a bunch of different directions. Typically when we do our biannual KPIs, so every January and then either around June or July, we'll do a pull-up assessment or a pull-up hold assessment. And typically, once we start to see people hold in that neutral grip pull-up position with their chin up on the bar, 40, 45 seconds, up to a minute, that's right around the time that person should be able to start developing a really good pull-up. Where they're gonna have the most problems 
is probably right there at the very, very top and at the very, very bottom. So what you really want to focus on is when you're doing those eccentric pull-ups in class, making sure that we lock in at the top before we take that foot off the bar so that we can control that eccentric at the very top. A lot of times what we see is that person takes their foot off the bar and maybe they're not mentally locked in yet and they do a very quick drop before those lats are able to really kick in and engage. So start pulling down on that bar before you even take your foot off of the rack or off the bar in front of you. And then ride that eccentric all the way down till we get elbows opened up, head through the window at the bottom, get a nice long stretch, maybe even hold it there for a second to really emphasize that initial pull-up position because that's where a lot of people have trouble just initiating is getting through that first little elbow bend, pulling that elbow down to their rib cage. And then lastly, go to practice four. We do a bunch of challenges in practice four. A lot of times they're geared around your pulling strength and your grip strength. There's going to be two of the most determining factors to helping improve your pull-up. So to wrap this question up, if you can do four sets of four reps with a 10 count eccentric, probably a pretty good indicator that you should be able to do one pull-up. Or if you could do a neutral grip pull-up hold for 40 to 45 seconds, that's probably a pretty good indicator. You're pretty close to being able to do a pretty good pull-up. Or the next person states that they often don't have enough time to get through the C-series in our strength class. And then they want to know my solution for this or what they should do to make up for it. My answer is this is a, a density problem. This is a, a work. Uh, this is like a fatigue problem for you. If you're not able to get through the prescribed workout in the, you know, if we cut out the movement prep and let's say the, uh, the description of the workout that the coach gives in the beginning, if you're not able to get to that workout in 48 to 50 minutes, you're probably taking a little bit too much rest, which is very rare to say in the strength class, but we need to work on our conditioning levels. Practice four is another great solution here because we should be able to move through that class at a little bit at either one of our classes, whether it's team or strength at a little bit faster pace. So if we're not finishing class on time, it's more so a likelihood that you're either taking too much time in between exercises, or maybe there's a logistical issue of trying to figure out weights and working in bridge and that type of stuff. But we want you to get more work done. So for this person, in this case, this means getting through that C-series in the same amount of time by cutting out a little bit of rest. And for them, that's going to mean increasing their conditioning levels. So... My first suggestion would be going to practice four. If that's not something you're already doing, that class, the second half of that class is geared towards improving your conditioning levels. Now, what can you do outside of Allegiant to improve that? First off is just our you know, classic zone one, zone two cardio. So go outside, get good 45 to 70 minute walks in on your off days. Uh, and then if we build up a certain conditioning level there and we wanted to start doing something that's a little bit higher intensity, whether that is swimming, biking, doing something like, you know, slow and methodical, but we'll get the heart rate up a little bit more like a skier or a rower. Maybe even it's running for some people. Careful with that last one. But getting into more of a zone two cardio to further build our conditioning so that we recover a little bit faster in between sets during our workout. And then that'll allow us to get through the entire workout. The next person states that they missed the defunct conditioning class warm up and wants to know, is that written down anywhere? My answer to you is the same answer I had to all of the employees we've ever hired who have asked me the exact same question. No, it is not written down anywhere. However, it is in my head. So we've got cars, we've got our nodding series, we've got our rib rolling, we've got our hip rocking, we've got a half kneeling ankle rock, a half kneeling wide hip rock and then a half kneeling wide T-spine rotation. From there, we stand up, we go through a toe touch matrix. So in this series, we're gonna reach down, touch our toes, reach up towards the sky three times, we're gonna reach across, reach across three times, and we go over the top, side bending, over the top, side bending, three times each direction. Now you're gonna repeat that series with your toes facing forward, your toes facing in, your toes facing out, your feet in a wide stance, your feet in a narrow stance, and a split stance with your right foot in front and a split stance in your left foot in front. Then we're gonna go through a squat matrix. So 
three squats. Again, repeat all of those feet positions. So three squats with your feet, toes facing forward, toes turned in, so on and so forth. Then we get into a little bit more of a dynamic warm up. So going knee hugs, ankle grabs, shin grabs, a walking toe touch or a calf sweep, whatever you want to call it, depending on whether or not you play soccer or if you're a normal human being. And then you get into world's greatest stretch, invert and hamstring, a lateral squat or a lateral lunge with a T-spine rotation and a straight leg kick. And that's it. That's the warm up. So there it is. I listed it out for you right there. Go ahead, head up to Aviation Park, knock that out on your own. This next question is in reference to our current challenge. So our current challenge is an analytics challenge where we are challenging our members, the ones who signed up for the challenge, to get in one force deck, one Nordboard, and one Dynamo each week. So we've set up at each location a kind of self-serve, self-service instructions on how to use those. So you can come in a little bit early and get them in before the workout. You can do them anytime during the workout or you can stay a couple minutes after and get them done after the workout. If you're doing a good job of getting at least three sessions in, then you only have to do one per session. And then if you have practice four, that can be a little makeup day too in there. So this person asked with all of that, all of those metrics and a little bit more focus from Allegiate on our members getting those metrics, how can people better use those metrics within their training session? So first and foremost, we need to gather a baseline. And that's why we've always encouraged when we give you, you know, the best score for you that day. So let's say that day I jumped 40 centimeters. I wanna go back in and I wanna plug that in on bridge. So if I'm on practice one, at the very, very top, it's gonna to say four stack counter movement jump or four stack CMJ. And I wanna plug in 40 centimeters there. And then that way I have a history. So if I can scroll back or if I do scroll back, I will see all of the previous jumps that I plugged something in on. And I can see if 40 jumps, 40 centimeter jump is good or if a 40 centimeter jump is bad. So now I can take that information and say, okay, well, usually I jump a 45. So today I might be a little bit tired and maybe that's going to, you know, whether I want it to or not, that's going to affect my weight. So if I try to go up in weight the way that I had planned in my head, it's going to feel harder than if I was feeling a little bit more fresh. Or I could say, all right, I'm not as fresh today as I thought I was. Let's make an adjustment here with the weights I was planning on using. So that's definitely the way that I would recommend that you use all of those analytics. And it doesn't have to be just for four stacks. So if I came in and I do a Nordboard and I usually pull 500, one day I come in and I pull 550, fantastic. I'm ready to go today. I'm feeling good. Even better if it's practice three and we're doing deadlifts. So I'm geared up. I'm ready to go. I get through my warm up sets, things are feeling good. Maybe I'm gonna throw on an extra five, 10 kilos that day because the analytics tell me that today's a go day. Now, the other thing we're looking for is again, tracking over time. So especially with our Nordboard and our Dynamo, we wanna see those numbers net get be better. Just like with so many other things in life, whether it's body weight or body composition, it's not going to be a linear path up. We're going to have days where we're fatigued. So we come in and we do Nordboard or we do Dynamo and our grip squeeze is down a little bit. But over the course of, say, six months, we should have a general trend line up and to the right. And that's part of the reason that we want to track these things on a weekly basis is so that we can get a good trend line for our members as far as giving you guys the success that you guys are earning every time you show up four times a week. And the last question asks, Trout or Otani? So I'm not really a baseball guy. In fact, I watch zero baseball throughout the year. I do know that Trout has been on the Angels for his entire career, and they've stunk. And Otani just switched teams and went to the Dodgers, who seem to lose in the playoffs every year. Um, so I'm going to say Otani's a traitor. I'm going to go with Trout. All right, that's it. Allegiant AMA block five. I appreciate everybody who submitted questions. If you guys like this video, please like subscribe. If you guys don't agree with something I said or want further detail, drop a note in the comments. Thank you everybody. Let's have a great block five.